Thank you for joining us for our mayoral candidates series. Uh, this morning is the actually the ninth in a 10 part series. And uh, today we welcome Diane Morales. Um, you know, as we, and we've, we've talked about this consistently as we quickly approach uh, the 2021 uh, primary elections, uh, which are just two months away, you know, we really understand what's at stake, right? This up upcoming election is perhaps the most consequential and important mayoral election in our city's history. Our city is fighting to recover from the unfortunate intersection of health emergencies, economic crisis, uh, socioeconomic unrest that were sparked by racial injustice across the country. And it's really important for us to think about how and in what ways Abney will serve its members and the city in the entire city of New York as we move forward. And this is something that we are constantly thinking about um, and uh, you know that is really important to all of us. So this is why we are so proud to offer this forum to hear directly from the candidates that are running to be the mayor, the next mayor of our great city. Uh, and today we welcome Diane Morales. Um, so Diane, as a New York City public school teacher, uh, she knows firsthand how segregated schools have divided young people based on race, income, zip codes, and she has a plan to execute an ed equity executive order, uh, which will uh, desegregate schools, free CUNY, which, you know, I wish I was around to, to benefit from that, uh, and increase culturally responsive schools, curriculum, and education. In her most recent position as executive director and CEO of Phipps Neighborhood uh, Housing, for almost a decade, she has managed multi-million dollar budgets, uh, resulted in the creation of career training and programs for young adults in the healthcare field, uh, just as an example. Her experience, and what she sees around her every day has really shaped her proposed policies and the things she will prioritize as mayor. Uh, and as the city recovers from COVID-19, she plans to implement a COVID-19 equity and data response unit to review, assess, and address the ongoing vaccine disparities throughout the city, especially in regard to race, gender, and sexual orientation. And now more than ever, as the city looks like it's about to reopen and the weather is warm, these are the things that we need to think about to make sure that our city stays healthy uh, as we look to recover from the last year. Uh, she also plans to advance a small business recovery strategy, including grant support for entrepreneurs that were impacted by COVID-19. Uh, within her first 100 days, she plans to tackle the homelessness crisis by providing more secure and guaranteed pathways towards permanent residents, including the prompt conversion of hotels into permanent support housing. And we've talked and we've heard a lot about this uh, proposal from others, other policymakers, um, as well as services for families over 100,000 unhoused school aged youth. We look forward to hearing more about these ideas and more uh, in a special announcement today. Uh, and ABNY members, please, please join me in welcoming Diane Morales. Diane, it's all, it's all yours. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Melva, so much for that um, really generous and thorough introduction. You clearly did your homework. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as stated, my name is Diane Morales. Um, I'm a bed -Stuy native. I'm a single mother, and I am the proud daughter of Puerto Rican parents and a first-generation college graduate. I'm running for mayor because it's time that our city serves all our people. We are care for our lives, our environment, and our economy ensures that we're all protected and where we bring those who have been historically marginalized to the center of governance. I come to you today, as Melva referenced, as a former nonprofit executive with decades of experience managing multi-million dollar budgets. Mind you, reimbursed at approximately 80 cents on the dollar, while at the same time providing impactful, quality, anti-poverty programs and direct services to the people who needed them most to make sure that they had access to opportunities to thrive and live in dignity. 
I also come to you as an advocate and a leader who has spearheaded career training programs for young adults and over programs that addressed housing insecurity, mental illness, the foster care system, and education. I know how to successfully execute on a vision, and I know how to work with the people of the city to get things done. And I also know that in the years ahead, as we move forward from the current crises, it is going to be the nonprofit human services sector that the city will rely on heavily to support the New Yorkers that have been impacted the most by these crises. Our city needs leadership that understands that work, leadership that can effectively engage those partners and support them in doing the transformative work that will be necessary, including prioritizing, reimbursing them for the true value of their work. Because of my experience and my expertise, I know the inequities that have existed for far too long, better than anybody else in this race. And I also know just how much the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated them. These are disparities that we as a city have never done enough to address. And the time is now. So today I'm gonna to talk about jobs. My campaign is rooted in three core pillars, dignity and solidarity for all New, York's, New Yorkers. Investing in job creation is actually a common thread that cuts across all three of those pillars and is central to making those values real. The status quo and you know what the through now we know is woefully inadequate. Here's what I know right now, the state. At the state level, over 800,000 New Yorkers were impacted by COVID and over 35,000 have died. At the state level, we also have an unemployment rate of 8%, which is more than double what it was this time last year. We've got 1.4 million households facing eviction. And of the New Yorkers that actually managed to hold on to their jobs, nearly 60% of them have reported a loss in household income. That's at the state. In the city, 25% of our residents are facing food insecurity. Our labor force has fallen by nearly 200,000, which is about almost 5% since November of 2019. 77% of our small businesses have reported a decrease in revenue, if they're, if they're still open. A decrease in revenue and sales or receipts by the end of, of April. And many of our businesses actually, uh, you know, as we know, many of those businesses were led by women of color um, and were essentially locked out of any kind of relief efforts. And finally, you know, 19% of our New York City residents are living below the New York City poverty line. I don't believe that it has to be this way. The, the realities that we are experiencing, the bleak realities that we are experiencing are actually the result of policy failures. They're the result of decisions that have been made by human beings that failed to center our dignity and failed to center care for everybody. I believe that these failures can be fixed with policy interventions designed by people who are committed to transforming the status quo. So today I am proud to debut to all of you a new plan from my platform. Plan is part of a multi-pronged strategy that will invest in the creation of jobs that contribute to equity and justice while also serving as a critical foundation to a new economy for New York City. My green jobs, green food and green justice proposal weaves together transformative policies that center communities that have been the most impacted by job loss but also positions them as central to a healthy, sustainable, and just future. The time for small thinking and Band-Aid solutions is over. We need this plan so that we can actually invest in communities and local businesses, good jobs, and promote public projects that improve the quality of life for all on the basis of dignity, care, and solidarity. 
So the green jobs component will provide meaningful pathways into inclusive and socially just employment that will play a fundamental role in accelerating the necessary shift that the city needs to achieve our employment, climate justice, sustainability, and resiliency goal. In order to do this, my administration is committed to doing the following. We will invest in a mass public employment program working towards a green municipal jobs guarantee that provides employment and apprenticeship opportunities. We'll shift of investments, city investments and business practices away from subsidies and tax breaks towards green infrastructure and retrofits, towards a workforce pipeline into urban gardening, towards sustainability and renewable energy. We'll also launch an urban climate core that focuses on restoring green spaces and public beautification. We will expand and strengthen opportunities for MWBEs, including specifically increasing opportunities to black, brown and indigenous communities, because we know that current and existing efforts for MWBEs have failed to actually do that in a meaningful way. We will support and center a fully resourced CUNY system as a research and development hub for green education, for training, and for project development in collaboration with local communities and unions. And we will align NYCHA objectives with the Federal Green New Deal for Public Housing to address, to begin to address the climate crises while creating employment pathways and reducing economic, racial, and gender inequality. This means that we will uh, we'll provide grants and investments in community workforce development, in energy retrofits, in energy efficiency, uh, building electrification upgrades and water quality for NYCHA, as well as investing in community energy generation, recycling and zero waste programs, community resilience and sustainability and climate adaptation and emergency disaster preparedness and response. The second piece is the green food. We will fight for food justice, which means essentially driving policies that fight poverty and expand access to nutrition, specifically engaging those in communities who have historically been harmed the most by food apartheid. So as mayor, I will establish an office of urban agriculture that would be run by actual urban farmers, not urban planners, and be focused on empowering small and mid-sized farmers in the region, especially black and brown growers. We will provide technical assistance for regional growers to compete for larger procurement contracts and other sourcing opportunities. And we'll provide resources to organizations like Just Food that are invested in the equitable distribution, smaller community models and organizations. We will also amplify strategies that we know work. Strategies like community supported agriculture, farmers markets, cooperatives, community based food hubs and community land trusts. And we will move away from food emergency to food equity by investing $25 million in food innovation and sustainability programs focused in communities of color. Finally, we'll move towards green justice. What do I mean by green justice? Well, we know that New Yorkers who are impacted by job loss and food injustice are also often disproportionately criminalized, discriminated against, and denied basic resources to thrive. These are all interconnected issues. So we've got to work to address them simultaneously in comprehensive ways. We cannot tackle these issues in silos. So as mayor, I will continue to push for the full decriminalization of cannabis in practice as well as in policy using a just framework. We'll also work to ensure the end of arrests of black and brown New Yorkers for possession 
and call for the full removal of cannabis related prior offenses. We'll also advocate for the reinvestment into the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by criminalization by including the support of black and brown, black and brown entrepreneurs, businesses, and worker self-managed and owned cooperatives in the cannabis industry and beyond. And we'll invest in CBOs that support community members that have been the most impacted by the legal system's response to ca cannabis. This isn't a pipe dream. These are radical ideas, but we are living in a radical time. This is actually doable, responsible, and necessary to stop the economic suffering in our city. To invest in our city and our future, my administration will embrace innovative community-led strategies and opportunities. So as part of doing this, we will transform and repurpose the Economic Development Corporation. The EDC is a, actually a creation of the interests of a few as opposed to the priorities of the many. This is important because while I fundamentally disagree with the way that it has operated, it's worth reminding ourselves that we have choices when it comes to the EDC and we can choose differently. One choice would be to get rid of it completely, and, and that's where we need to be actually if we can't radically change its function. But I also believe that at a time of recovery, we can adopt a completely different vision and mission for the EDC, where we embrace a shift towards a social partnership model with partners and investors who are committed to prioritizing how we address the social determinants of health through evidence-based strategies. To that end, my administration would repurpose the EDC as the Public Development Corporation. And all projects would be required to yield social returns on investments through inclusive and intersectional development with metrics in racial and gender equity, environmental resilience, and healthy, sustainable neighborhood economies. The Public Development Corporation would support bringing and expanding cooperative economic strategies, democratizing healthcare, and, public, and growing public infrastructure needs to mass scale that would potentially accelerate not only recovery, but equity throughout the city. Second, my administration will embrace revenue generation meant to distribute prosperity and opportunity more fairly across the city. So to do that, I would support and advocate for legislation to create a public bank that would serve the public interest. A public bank that would divest from predatory and extractive practices of commercial banks and invest locally in public and community enterprises and projects in the pursuit of the long-term economic health of the city. That would enable us to leverage public funds to create credit that serves the public, including providing reasonable and fair loans to small and mid-sized businesses, which are a critical component of my plan for establishing a new economy for New York City, along with specific supports for minority and women-owned businesses. Third, we need to move money out of policing and incarceration and into communities by reallocating $3 billion of the New York Police Department's overall budget so that we're, we can finally move to creating conditions that prevent harm and create jobs that, addresses, that address crises with dignity and empower communities to create solutions that decrease the likelihood and the need for NYPD intervention. Finally, I'd say that we, we would utilize and prioritize the $6 billion in federal COVID relief dollars to strengthen our social safety net and act as a further accelerant for our economy. What we can't forget in all of this is that it's been our most vulnerable. Communities of color, the working class, women, immigrants, young people, the disabled, and so many others that have disproportionately carried the weight and pain of an economy that has made us sick, that has exploited our labor, and has spun our natural environment into a state of crisis. 
We need to imagine a new economy in New York City and create new sustainable systems of health, security, growth, and opportunity. We can do this from the ground up and out. We have the grit, we have the resources, we have the power to do it. We just need the leadership. My first 100 days in office will be committed to launching social and economic transformation for New York City, prioritizing those left behind and stabilizing the conditions around housing, health, education, and the economy, all of which the mayor can impact. But we're not gonna stop there. Through the co-creation of solutions and community-led and transformative principles, we will create sustainable measures that eradicate the disparities and generate healthier, economically secure communities. We will initiate a new age of just economic opportunity and, and establish, nurture, and support small businesses in a way that does not extract our labor, our dignity, or our joy. Our city deserves more than the short-term fixes we have become accustomed to applying. We deserve solutions that match the scale of the crisis that we're facing. Despite all the fears about the budget shortfall, I actually think we can't afford to go back to normal. Now is the time to transform our city. If we fail to rise to this moment, the suffering in the city is not only going to continue, it is going to deepen and it's going to impact generations to come. It's time for us to commit to advancing an agenda that is rooted in dignity, care, and solidarity. We just need to be brave enough to embrace it and to build a new New York City. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of, we have a, we have a lot of questions. Uh, so, so let's start <laughs> a bit deeper into um, uh, green jobs and, and and can you just get a little more granular for us in terms of like what kind of small business is this sort of go to con ed and say we need to reimagine energy is this go to <laughs> kind of try to create um you know enhance local businesses or create local businesses that that employ people in, you know in the community like can, can you just dive yeah in I, yes yes so the priority that you know the the, the the core principle behind the sort of new economy uh, proposal in, in, in my platform is in fact the idea of building an economy that is local, right? So, so moving away from um, historic practices of the over-reliance on external large corporations and, and businesses that come into our communities, exploit our labor and extract our wealth and instead uh, sort of inverting that model so that we are in fact prioritizing and supporting small and mid-sized businesses and the growth and the ownership of um, local communities of all of the resources that they need access to so that, so that we are not just investing locally, but we're generating a local economy because we know that small and mid-sized business owners actually tend to live in their communities and reinvest in their communities. So we're talking about a transformative model of the economy um, that is really locally based. Um, and all of these sort of uh, components or, or prongs, if you will, are intended to support the, not just the seeding of that, but the long-term nurturing um, and growth and sort of stabilizing of that. No, I, so like, I, I'm a big believer in, in supporting local uh, retail, local restaurants. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, the world at large, not just New York City, has gotten intensely attached to whether you want to say it's order. Let's just call it ordering things online and the convenience mm -hmm. and the cost effectiveness of doing that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I wonder, like, are we? How do you fight that kind of trend? If these things are so habitual. And do you think, how, how do we, how do we win that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, um, uh, you know, one is that there are increasingly, and, and we're, we're not quite ready to uh, roll this part out yet, um, but there are increasingly um, worker owned technological platforms um, that are growing. And um, I think that we, there's, there's a lot of room for us to support, stimulate and expand that 
even on the local level, right? So that so that local businesses have access to that in a robust way. Um, but also, I think you know uh, there is also a, a, a balance between that and and creating sort of the the local access to people, um, so that folks are able to walk down the block or around the corner to the you know the local business and um, you know purchase whatever they need. I, I think that I think that part of the online culture uh, has also increased and expanded because we have moved away from that sort of very local economy model where, where everything is available to you within a, relative, a relatively small radius. Um, and I think what we're talking about is both uh, reinvesting and, and rebuilding that in a different kind of way, but also balancing it with a technological piece uh, because there are, I mean, you're right, right? There is the need to, to provide that as well. I just don't know that we, I don't believe that it all has to be based on these large extractive type corporations. I think that it's possible for us to actually do both with the with the prioritization of small and mid-sized local businesses. I, I look, we, we 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 believe in wanting to keep our, our money here. So I think and, and supporting local businesses, it's depressing to see all the empty yeah. storefronts and, and the small businesses that have gone. Away. Yeah, I mean, I think the the other, the other thing I'll say to that, um, sorry, Stephen, is is that um, you know the the historic way in which we focused on large sort of corporate businesses um, fails to acknowledge actually the fact that uh, fifty percent of the New York City workforce is actually employed by our small and mid sized businesses, right? Um, so the over prioritization and focus on these large businesses um, sort of it you know disproportionate you know, shifts the balance or the weight of, of our economy to an external force where we could in fact, again, make a decision that we're gonna prioritize the small and mid-size mid um, growth first. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't think we ever get to a place where there's no you know, large outside corporations um, doing business, but I, I think there's a, there's, there's a need to make a deliberate and conscious shift towards what we prioritize our investments in. And then, and then can you go a bit deeper on kind of local urban agriculture as tied to this in, in green jobs? Are they, um, you know, we, we, all, we all mostly walk on pavement. So how does that work? Is it that we have relationships with surrounding farmers? Are there, is, is, are there rooms to farm? Like are these vertical farms? Do we need to farm in the city to do this well? Yeah. Or is that yeah. done otherwise? I mean, I, I think I, I don't. I mean, I don't think we can realistically do all of this internally in the city, right? Um, there are regional um, growers and farmers um, that are black and brown um, that actually have partnerships with distributors um, in the city that are also black and brown. Over the course of the last year, I've been um, really blessed to be deeply involved um, with Bed Stuy Strong, which is one of the mutual aid um, groups that sort of came up in the midst of the pandemic when the when our city government was falling short, um, and and you know we were very conscious actually in doing the work that we've been doing in providing mutual aid to not um, to to build on existing community institutions and sort of pillars of the community, right? And, and one of the ways that we did that actually was to partner with Brooklyn Packers, which is a black and brown worker owned cooperative um, that has been sourcing from black owned farms outside of New York City, sourcing from black owned farms, packaging and distributing food here locally. So it's that chain of, of food supply um, that moves communities away from the food, uh, you know, apartheid into food sovereignty um, and, and allows access to low income black and brown communities to quality healthy food that by design have, has not been available to them historically, right? Uh, I don't think it's an accident that um, in, in most black and brown low income communities, you don't, they, they, they don't live five minutes, within five minutes of fresh fruits and vegetables, right? Um, and so we have to make a deliberate decision to, again, to transform that. And that requires very specific strategies and tactics to address it. We can't just keep focusing on the emergency food provision um, because that's addressing the symptom. It's not actually addressing the structural and systemic root causes of the issues. 
Um, and so if we move away from the emergency food provision and instead empower and support these kinds of alternate systems, we're actually supporting those communities um, in gaining increased independence and sovereignty. And that is, uh, the, that is at the core of every, every policy in my, in my, my campaign and administration. Um, you've said before that you were raised in a community that um, was 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 uh, uh, like a strong community and deeply caring and helpful and filled in for where the city did not provide the things that you expected the city yeah. to provide. So, it, it, if you were mayor, yeah. what are like how do you change that? And what are the top of the list? What are the two things that are the most important? One, two that you think that the city is missing that has been put into other force others to do? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is housing. Um, you know, uh, when, you know, when I talk about it, I think about my, my childhood, um, we, and you know, this wasn't something that I was conscious of growing up as a kid, but we always had somebody else living with us. Just, just, you know, um, a cousin, an aunt, uh, you know, there was always someone else. We were always providing shelter for people while they got stabilized in some way and were able to, um, you know, make a move of their own. Um, and, and when I think about that, I think about our current status in terms of housing. I think about the number of people that are homeless. I think about the number of people that are housing insecure. Um, and I think about the, the failure of our, of our city to prioritize housing as a human right. Um, I think about the you know, commodification of housing, the, the prioritization of developers in any kind of um, plan around you know, housing and, and community needs um, and how the, the profit for developers and, and the, the, you know, what the developers want has been the primary driver in, in planning and the um, allocation of resources as opposed to um, what my platform talks about and fo focuses on, which is the investment in and the expansion of social housing, um, including NYCHA, including supportive housing, including you know, cooperative housing, um, and the ability to really prioritize people's right to, just, to not just access housing, but to live in quality housing um, and to have it be permanent and affordable housing. Those are policy choices. Um, and I believe that we can make different choices and that we need to actually make different choices, that we are at a crossroads um, in, in sort of the history of our city um, and have a choice, an opportunity here to do something different that allows us to actually become the, the sort of city that, you know, all the rhetoric talks about in terms of being the greatest city in the world. Because I think that the part of the measure of being the greatest city in the world is, is actually the status of our most vulnerable. And right now, our, our, you know, our, our most vulnerable, they're, A, there's a lot more of them, and, and B, they're really suffering. Um, and I think that we can do this. I think we, we have the resources, we have the, we have the diversity, we have the smarts. Um, I think we just need to have the sort of moral and political courage to put a stake in the ground and make the decision that we're going we're gonna to do this together. Uh, you mentioned um, that our most vulnerable are suffering. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the homeless population, uh, and, let's, and the, the city in the last, in this administration has greatly increased um, its expenditure, but yet we do not seem to be doing a better job of caring for that population. Um, what would you do that would be different to make um, it work? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I think it's how we spend those dollars. Um, again, um, you know, we have not we have not created nearly enough affordable housing units. Um, we continue to invest in a shelter system um, that has become somewhat of an industrial complex. Um, I, I think we need to prioritize the creation of really affordable permanent housing for people and reinvest those dollars. Right. So I've talked about. Um, you know, right now we have plenty of vacant hotel spaces. I've talked about, you know, being really, really critical about doing an analysis of those spaces and converting a significant portion of those spaces into permanent housing. I've talked about investing in NYCHA. I mean, NYCHA is actually the, you know, the greatest example of social housing and there's a significant 
there's not there's a not a significant number of, of units that are just sitting vacant and in repair. Um, I've talked about the uh, ex investment in an expansion of community land trusts that would really enable um, communities to be real partners in the envisioning of, um, of, of what happens in their communities and actually, you know, create sort of neighborhoods and communities that have housing and, and supermarkets and drugstores and banks um, and really kind of go back to that original, you know, the other conversation we were having about what's accessible, the local businesses. Um, I think that our investments need to be in that. When you look at the, the investments and what has happened over the last eight years in particular, you look at the um, market rate or luxury units that have been created in comparison to the affordable units, we, we failed. Um, and, and we need to actually prioritize the investments in, in in affordable permanent housing for all New Yorkers. Um, a couple of questions for you. Okay. Uh, so we talk about investing in social uh, housing. Um, what does the budget look like? How much does this cost, and 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 where do you get the where do you get the money from? Um, so you know, I think the first thing uh, we're, we're in the process of doing this. So the first thing we need to do is to look at the current dollars that we have provided in tax incentives and subsidies for 21A. Um, all of those dollars that we have prioritized and provided to developers, um, I would reallocate and reinvest um, in supporting my plan and my vision for housing for New York. I think that is the that's the first step, um, including a gradual sort of transition for, from the shelter-based system for the $3, $3 billion from the shelter-based system um, into the provision of, of permanent housing. Um, and then I think there's, you know, we're just starting to dig the relief from that we could invest. But this is, this is a question of, um, it's less a question of how much than, than how we spend the money that we have, right? And, and taking a look at the investments that we have been making historically, in particular over the last eight years, um, in the development of affordable housing, um, and and repurposing that first, um, again, and you know taking a look at the shelter-based budget and looking at how we gradually move away from that. Also taking a look at and hopefully you know working with the state because I think the state needs to also increase its investment, um, in particular in NYCHA. Um, and the COVID relief package. So that's the, those are the sort of funding streams that we're, we're looking at when we talk about um, really investing in deeply in affordable permanent housing for everybody. Um, can, you, can you talk a bit about, um, uh, by the way, and, and just back on, on NYCHA, the state's sometimes a hard place to get money, right? Yeah. And obviously uh, <laughs> this administration has had a uh, complicated relationship at time with the state. How do you go about that differently to mm -hmm. make it work differently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, a couple of different things. Um, yes, the state has been a hard place to get money. Um, I, I think we haven't had leadership in the city um, that has really been able to or willing to stand up for us and advocate for us in the way that we deserve. Um, we know that New York City contributes far more to the state budget than we get back in return. Um, more than our fair share. Um, so I, I think part of that, you know, what I've what I've stated publicly in terms of the relationship with um, with this current administration is that um, I'm unabashed and unapologetic about the needs uh, for for the city. My administration, to be clear, um, will be made possible by the people of New York City. Um, I'm not going to Albany to fight for our fair share by myself, and I'm not going with a lobbyist to sit in the back room of a, you know, of a club somewhere and try to negotiate policy. I'm going up there with, with you know, busloads of New Yorkers um, who are going to demand what we deserve. Um, I also am increasingly um, hopeful, uh, based on the, the 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 state legislature and some of, some of our partners there, um, in terms of a shared vision for what we need to be doing for New York. Um, specifically to NYCHA, you know, I think for too long we have divested from NYCHA, right? And, and interestingly enough, the divestment in the, the divestments from NYCHA began when NYCHA became predominantly black and brown. We can't, we, we you know, we can't hide that. Um, that is a fact. Um, and we need to, we need to recognize that we need to reinvest in the community that harm the most. So part of that is Albany, but part of that is also the federal government. Um, and, and, you know, and, and taking the fight to DC as well, so that the, so that they begin to put dollars back 
into our, you know, the largest public housing development in the country, uh, because we know that those are actually also the very people that were a critical part of, of enabling the city to continue operating through this crisis. Um, and it is time that we take care of those people that took care of us. Um, so that's, that's kind of my commitment. Um, and, you know, I, I'm unapologetic about it. Uh, I am accountable to the people who have made me successful thus far, and that's the community. So those are the folks that will be at the table with me in, in pushing and, and making these decisions. Um, you, you mentioned uh, specifically communities that are hurting the most um, yeah. are um, Asian American neighbors and fellow New Yorkers at this time are really the subject of what has been a, 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 a tragic wave of violence Absolutely. against them. Uh, that isn't that has while well has been in the news recently has been going on for some time uh, yeah, before that. Um, can you talk about what you would do specifically to protect that community and how that might be a model for other communities? Yeah, so, you know, I've talked about this a lot. We, we actually um, hosted a, um, a town hall a couple of weeks ago with some um, allies from the, from the Asian American community. Um, I don't think this looks different than what we do um, for other communities in terms of safety, other communities of color specifically. We've got to recognize that the, that the violence and the hatred um, that is being directed towards the Asian American community right now is in fact rooted in, in, in racism um, that is deeply rooted and connected it, you know, to everything in this country. Um, and so the, the path towards keeping our communities safe is solidarity. Um, is, is, is communities coming together to, to fight against this sort of imperialistic, racist, classist foundation of so many of our systems and, and structures. And the way that we do that is in fact by over, by transforming the systems that perpetuate inequities um, and providing people with the resources that they need to be safe, providing housing, providing mental health support, providing quality education, providing jobs um, so that people are safe. People are not, um, you know, the, the, the behavior that we're seeing is, is like, like I said, is deeply rooted. It has been exacerbated for sure over the course of the last 15 months by the rhetoric around COVID-19 um, and the things that our, our leaders have enabled, you know, have facilitated and allowed to perpetuate. But really the best counter to this is by providing people with the resources that they need to live safely and in dignity um, and recognizing the shared sort of challenges across communities um, that hurt and impact many of our most vulnerable the most. Um, as as you, you talked about those resources and, and you've talked about shifting resources and cutting $3 billion out of the NYPD, um, would that, um, which is about half their budget, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, yeah, it's half the, the transparent budget. There's a lot of there, you know, there's a lot of other lines in the um, New York City budget that are much more um, obfuscated that, in fact, support the NYPD budget. But yes, that's the that's the number. Um, uh, on a, in absolute terms, that's a lot of money, uh, yeah. and I think we all appreciate the need to. Uh, give people dignity and have more than that. Jumani Williams said to us a long time ago, uh, and, and somebody our community is a big fan of and, uh, and has spoken to us a bunch of times, um, we're not trying to just meet one need of the community. We're, we're, from a, from a, from a, we're trying to meet it in lots of places, so there's just That's less right. people in the system. At the same time, uh, safety is impacted by the number of police. Uh, wouldn't, exactly. Would cutting $3 billion out of the PD take down the number of police officers? Yes, that's the intention. Um, and how many? That is, that and, is the intention. And, uh, and so specifically officers on the streets and, and, and the kind of old community policing model created by, um, by you know, actually by David, uh, Mayor Dinkins when he was mayor. Um, mm -hmm. And how many officers, Kai Jass, would you envision uh, mm -hmm. whether it's repurposing or just taking off the streets? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me just start off by um, pushing back on the premise that police officers make our cities, uh, our streets safer. Um, we, you know, um, I, I, first of all, police are actually intended to respond to crime, not to prevent it. That's just kind of the function, right? You call 911 after something takes place, not before. Um, 
And so they, they, you know, they're not actually effective, I don't believe, um, interveners or preventers of crime. Um, and that, you know, we see that in terms of the increased supposedly, you know, police presence um, in the subway system. That's not, that has not actually had a, a, a marked difference in, in the decrease of, of what is taking place there. Um, what I do believe we need to actually focus on is again, um, reclaiming and redefining what public safety means and what it looks like. Um, we know that a significant percentage of the calls that the NYPD responds to are actually issues related to homelessness, to substance abuse, to mental health. Um, and what happens in those instances is a man with a gun responds. And in the best case scenario, the person gets locked up overnight and gets released the next day back to the very same circumstance that they were in before. And in the worst case scenario, they get shot and killed. So, you know, my proposal, a key part of my proposal has been to establish the Community First Responders Department, which would in fact be staffed by professionals who are trained and skilled at intervention and de-escalation, medics, social workers, mental health specialists, um, but also serve as part of a larger ecosystem of social service and human service organizations so that we can actually connect the people in distress and in crisis to services that will help actually end the cycle of, of whatever situation they're experiencing and help them move towards healing and recovery rather than just locking them up for a little, a little bit and then releasing them back to where, from whence they've come where they're still dealing with the same issue. We actually have to uh, focus on interventions that transform the situation so that we decrease the need to begin with. Um, and so my proposal has been to create this department and also to bolster the human service and nonprofit providers that can also provide the additional support for these folks so that we're actually working towards, um, you know, transformation and, and you know, restorative uh, interventions rather than, than things that do further harm um, to, to communities. Um, and, and that's one of the critical pieces that I think we need to do. I've also talked about removing um, police officers from schools um, and instead, you know, providing the types of supportive you know, nurses, social workers, guidance counselors that our students actually need um, to address their own needs. And, but I think, and, and, and I, I just want to ask one last specific question. Sure. Well, someone deep in our, in our Abney community uh, runs a small business in Chinatown, is of Asian American descent, and said yeah. to us just recently, like, it's Chinatown's empty. Yep. And it's scary for me to walk home and, and scary for my staff to leave. And, and, and Lee said, I, I seeing an officer, I think makes me feel safer that someone, you know, that won't disrupt, whether it's me or our community. I guess the question I have is, do you, do you not feel that's a reasonable perspective for her to yeah. have? Yeah, I certainly understand where that comes from. I was just in Chinatown yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I understand where that comes from. Um, and I think that if we are investing in the communities, you know, revitalizing our businesses um, and bringing things back, um, that will begin to address that fear and that concern, right? That isolation, um, you know, the increased violence that we that the that the Asian American community has experienced. The, the you know, the concerns are valid. Um, I, 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 I feel that, um, and I, I don't disagree with the, with the, with the concerns. I just think that the solution and the path to addressing it looks different, um, in terms of a long-term healthy and sustainable, um, solution that looks different, right? I, I don't believe that the, that the long-term healthy solution to that is to have police officers on every corner. Um. In, in a shift, I'd love to talk to you about um, the mental health crisis we seem sure. to be having as a result of, of COVID and, um, and, and the challenges people are having personally. Um, the, the city has, has made mental health a, a, a priority in this administration, um, which has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, can I ask how you might go about uh, in your own way dealing with yeah. those issues? Yeah. And, what you, and what you would do. Yeah, um, I appreciate this question actually, because this is a complex, you know, this is like uh, 
all of the issues that we're talking about are complex issues um, and there is no sort of single silver bullet, that's a terrible expression, there's no single um, remedy um, that, that's gonna address all of it. But one of the things I've called for is the actual sort of expansion of um, integrated community health clinics. Um, I, I think we need to expand significantly the spectrum of, of health, mental health services that are available to New Yorkers. My daughter um, has struggled with mental health challenges for, for quite some time. She's 20 years now. Um, and I've talked about this publicly and with her permission. So I, I'm okay doing that right now. Um, and I am educated, I'm pretty well networked um, and I'm a fierce advocate. And yet we spent in 2015, two days in the hallway of an emergency room waiting to get access to appropriate care for her. Um, the system is broken. And so, you know, we need to radically transform what's available. I, you know, the, the, lo the local clinics I talked about um, should be able, should, should provide individual support. They should provide group support. They should provide support that is um, both sort of, you know, of the highest clinical level, but also um, peer support. Um, you know, with, with, with peers that have had shared experiences that can, you know, provide and facilitate groups. Um, we really need to dramatically expand the resources that we're making available to address this. I've also called for the, it, here's what I think. Our mental health situation was bad before COVID. Now we have people that were frail, you know, fragile before that have been you know, added this additional burden um, and crisis of COVID, we're not ready to address the mental health crisis that awaits us on the backside of this. You know, when, when people are, are once again moving about freely and we've started to see that already, um, we need sort of a clarion call to provide and expand the types of supports that we're able to provide to people um, across the continuum of sort of interventions, everything from, you know, individual and group and sort of informal community peer-based stuff to the higher levels of intervention and support. Um, and so I, you know, the community first responders department is a critical part of that for me in terms of, um, you know, in intervention first line of defense, the integrated community health clinics that would provide access on a preventative basis as well as a longer term intervention. Um, there was one other piece of that intervention. Um, oh, I'm forgetting it. Uh, but there, you know, I, I just, ultimately, I think that we need to really dramatically ex expand that. I, I've also talked about, um, I'm just blanking on it. I apologize. No worries. A third really, one. I, It'll I, come to me and then I'll blurt it out. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Look, I, I, I would say the data would show that we all have mental health health issues in our families. I want to say thank you for sharing the story of your daughter. I think it's thank you. that type of personal story is hard to, to share. It's it's brave of her to let you share it. And I think it is impactful when someone comes to govern that, that you know, there's a humanity to it, I think, yeah. uh, in that. So thank you. Thank um, you I, 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 I want to just ask about the Board of Ed and uh, ending mayoral control. They're not often I'm fine to not often mayors who ask to end mayoral control. <laughs> uh, if I use a contrarian, Can you just a little bit about that and, 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 and what you see as the right path here. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's great. Um, so actually, so my, my response to that is actually a little bit more nuanced than I get credit for. Um, so, you know, I, having, having been a former classroom teacher, um, having worked at the Department of Education, I, um, I don't think what we're doing right now works, right? We're, we've, we've moved away from real meaningful community voice at the table, the, the critical stakeholders. That being said, I also remember the days pre-mayoral control. And that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a desirable system either. So what I have said to the advocates is, I agree with you that what we're doing right now doesn't work, um, but let's work together to co-create what the alternative model is. Because I think it's somewhere between those two things um, and I think actually that the mayor needs to be accountable for what's happening in the education system. Um, but there also needs to be some model of shared governance um, that gives communities a meaningful 
um, voice in the process um, and in the design of what is happening um, because we've completely excluded <clears throat> and pushed out teachers and parents uh, and students even um, from the process. So, you know, I don't know, I, I don't, a counter proposal as of yet, we are, you know, I, there is a group called Educators for Diane that is um, working with me on this. Um, but I don't think, you know, it's not a panacea, the idea of like just giving up mayoral control, because that's what we had before and that system wasn't working. So um, I, I think this is an opportunity for us to co-create something completely different. Um, that balances the the scales much more, while also you know, the the piece that I think we can't let go of is the mayoral accountability. Uh, we can't let the mayor off the hook. The mayor needs to be responsible for what's happening with our with our children. All right, thank you. I've got one last question for you. Okay. You're talking about radical reinvention of government, uh -huh. and in deference to everyone who has held this job, it seems to be a hard job to do well, which points to the point that you said of these issues are complicated and nuanced. Mm -hmm. But since we've talked a lot about what you don't like, what do you love now about how this city runs? What would you say, that's great, we need to do more of that just the way we're doing it? Is there anything? Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I mean, expanding our education to include um, 3K um, was was definitely the right move and the right direction. I, you know, the, how we did it as someone who was involved in, in the implementation, how we did it was less than desirable, um, but the, the sort of the mission of it was spot on. Um, and I think that um, doing that better and expanding it um, downwards to the younger ages is exactly the right direction that we should be moving in. So that, that actually, um, I've 100% uh, supported the idea as someone who also founded, you know, was a founding member of a national early literacy program, um, Jumpstart, I, uh, I am a full supporter and believer in, in early literacy interventions. Perfect. Well, look, thank you. I'll say something about our community. We love ambition and we love bold and we love people who care about the city and want to make it more fair and more equitable and work for is really for everybody. And I just want to say thank you for your time. We're all trying to make informed decisions about who we vote for and your passion and your care and your insight are evident. And we wanted to wish you luck, but we really wanted to say thank you for this time with us today. Thank you all so much. It was really great to have the opportunity, not just to talk to you all, but to, you know, to not get cut off after 60 seconds um, and not get muted. Um, wow, it's it's like a game changer. It's a real Nobody conversation. All the time. It's like, <laughs> can we stop? <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and your interest. Um, I look forward to staying in touch. Be well and stay safe. You too. Thank you. Bye, everybody.